Hello, and welcome everyone to another Sales Hacker webinar. Thank you for hanging out with us for the next 45 minutes uh, to an hour or so. Uh, I know we're all still in isolation, or most of us. Uh, so sometimes it can be nice to have uh, a little human interaction. So um, I'm looking forward to this one. I have uh, an incredible guest, uh, someone uh, who I admire. I've heard speak before at one of the coolest companies uh, out there, uh, a company that has done wonders for my own career. Uh, I'm joined by Alyssa Merwin, the VP of Sales at LinkedIn. Alyssa, welcome. Hey, Scott. Thanks for having me. It's great to have some human interaction for me as well. <laughs> right. Don't don't lie. We all know you had a, a hundred meetings leading up to this, um, virtual or not. Um, but I'm really looking forward to this. So, um, for everyone who's hanging out with us, I know you you're you're kind of trickling in now. Uh, we had uh, about 800 folks, so it's so cool to see everyone jumping in and using this time to kind of level up, which I think is the best thing that you can do um, if you've been furloughed, laid off. We're just trying to get better at your job as a leader, as a professional. Um, so we're going to be having a fireside chat. I'll be kind of leading this discussion, but a few housekeeping items before we dive in. So number one, it's always much more enjoyable for myself and for the, the guest, Alyssa, uh, if we know who we're hanging out with, if we know who we're talking to. And we would love it if you could kind of help drive the, the discussion we'll have today. So uh, there is a chat feature. If you want to jump on right now, introduce your name, your title, and the company that you work for, that would be great. I'll give some shout outs and then also just helps us frame the, the conversation a little bit. Um, and then second, this is recorded. So if you have a baby screaming in the background or like Alyssa, a new puppy, uh, that you you got tricked into getting during, during quarantine um, and you have to take care of it, please go do so. We'll send this recording within about 24 hours. Um, so don't, don't worry about that. And what we're going to be talking about is how to successfully make this transition to all digital selling. So a lot of us were doing digital selling before, but now it's sped up uh, digital kind of transformation. Uh, quick shout outs to Chris, James, Liz, Adriana, Amanda, John, Anita, Andrea. It's pouring in. Thank you all for hanging out with us. So, Alyssa, let's do a poll really quick. If you're on board, um, we'll get a, a pulse check. So, first poll we're going to do Are you wearing pajamas right now? I, I, I don't, I've got like, I don't know about you, Alyssa. You look like you, you, you have, dressed up. I've, I've made this transition to kind of upscale leisure wear now. So I'm still wearing sweatpants. They're just slightly nicer sweatpants. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't gone there yet. I, uh, <laughs> I think on a Friday, I've let myself do like a more casual, but I'm trying to, I'm just trying to, you know, get my head in the game every day. So yeah. try, yeah. trying to keep the work wear going as long as I can. But I'll tell you, I am running out of options. So there's that. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a transition for sure. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we've got never. So most people are saying never. 64% are, Alyssa, on your side. They're still getting ready, putting those work clothes on. I think it's 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 important. It does put you in that uh, frame of mind. I literally took them off a minute ago. 7%, 14%, business on top, PG's on the bottom. I thought that one would be higher. 15%, 100%, yes. I appreciate, I appreciate that some people are being very honest about the business on top, hurting on the bottom. <laughs> I love it. Um, okay, one more, and then we, we will dive into it. Um, I, I think we just want to know what people came here for today, and then we know what to, to focus most on. So here are the options. Learn how top sellers are adapting to virtual selling. Understand how customers' needs and decision processes are changing. It's a big one, too. Pick up best practices to engage with buyers and how reps can be successful in the new sales environment. Any predictions, Alyssa? Mm, well, I mean, I think there are a couple of these that are a similar theme, but, uh, you know, I, I think everyone's interested in how, how to be successful right now, whether 
it's on the buyer's expectations or how to be a better seller. They're all related. So I, I think we're going to see an even spread, but let's see. Yeah. All right. So we have learn how top sellers are adapting to, okay. to virtual selling. That's perfect. You're on the right, right uh, webinar, people. So that's that's perfect. All right. Let's dive into it. And I think an important place to, to kind of start is the current landscape we're in, you know, we, we all know things, things have changed. What challenges are you seeing in the current landscape, both from the team that you lead at LinkedIn, and then maybe some of the um, customers and prospects that you, that you work with? Sure. And, and you know what, Scott, before I answer that, maybe I'll give a little bit of context because I think that a perspective may be helpful for everyone to know. Yeah. The, the perspective that I that I have. Um, so I lead our sales navigator business for uh, North America. And that means that my team, which is composed of everything from our SMB to our key accounts team. So that's inside sales to field sales and uh, acquisition and existing customer and, and growth. Uh, so that it, you know, as a pre-representative of many sales teams, a little bit of everything. And then we, our sellers, our, excuse me, our buyers are typically heads of sales. So it's going to be a VP of sales, a CRO, um, oftentimes a C-suite is involved, but those are our primary buyers as well as marketing is often involved and, and potentially sales ops. So, you know, it, Given this is the Sales Hacker podcast, you know I think that the the demographic that we engage with uh, gives you know we we get a lot of visibility not only in terms of how our own sales team is needing to adapt and change, but also because we're dealing with other heads of sales and, and sales leaders. Um, and so, you know, it's been an interesting transition and journey for all of us. Um, you know, I think like all companies, we had to go. We had a very in office culture, so even though we had field sellers. Almost everyone was expected to be in one of our major offices across um, the country, and then you you know you'd go travel to your your accounts as it made sense. And overnight, we we had to you know turn that perspective upside down. And you know even our most junior reps, the SMB teams, where we'd always said, well, we need to be in office together, building the culture and the camaraderie and all of that. Of course, now we're all figuring out how to do that virtually. And I think we've made a lot that transition relatively well as many companies have at this point we're sort of through the really rocky part of you know getting people set up with the right technology the desks and you know everything they need to be um, productive and then managing through the early days it was I think fear you know mm -hmm. fear for our own safety and health safety and health um, and then also trying to figure out is it okay to reach out and sell in this environment and mm -hmm. You know, so we're, we're going through our own journey of really trying to figure out uh, where are we now? And I think we've gone from the sort of frozen mode, which I would have characterized a, you know, a couple months ago, uh, to trying to be a little bit more on the front foot. And I think part of that is because we, we've recognized that in our situation, in our, our case, we have a solution that's really valuable in a virtual environment. And so we can talk more about that. But, you know, I think mm -hmm. that um, a lot of our sellers at first, though, were really concerned about, is it appropriate? Is it appropriate to be reaching out? And I think a lot of our customers are going through that same set of questions and trying to figure out, you know, can should we be trying to build new pipeline and, and build new relationships or focusing on existing or something else? And so we can talk more about that. But that's one yeah. of the biggest shifts and challenges that, that we have gone through and I think are hopefully on coming back out the, the other side now. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, definitely a, a difficult one. It's like there's not very many jobs where you're put in an environment where you almost feel guilty for doing your job right? right it's such a strange thing to to deal with and i think that's how a lot of sellers and sales leaders were were feeling at the beginning um so when now that you've made this transition and you know it's it's going well um uh, i know at, at outreach and, and sales hacker uh, we were pleasantly surprised i think with how everyone uh, adapted and even some of the the results that we're seeing, whether it's on our SDR team or or um, AEs. Do you think it will have a material impact after? Do you, like do you see it going back to the way it was, where everyone's expected to be in office? Putting you on the spot a little bit here. I know yeah. Twitter made the the change. 
you know, I, I think every company is probably going to address it differently. And I think de depending on what industry you're in and where you're located may play a big role. Uh, you know, I think the tech companies are taking a, a bit more, of, I don't know if it's progressive, but a, a bit of a stronger stance saying, you know, we're either going to be remote, in, uh, you know, indefinitely, or we're going to give customers, or, sorry, our employees uh, flexibility. And I think I, I would hope that a lot of companies, if they're able to have their, their employees be productive in a virtual environment, that we allow people to do that until everyone feels like it's safe to go back. And so, I, you know, I think... I think it's hard to say, but one thing that feels very clear is it's not changing anytime soon. I, you know, I was talking to one of our customers who said that, you know, they're not going to allow any vendors, partners, salespeople on site uh, at their office, even once they open back up for at least a year. And so whether we ask people to come into the office or not, uh, we, we may not be allowed to go into the offices of of the people that we, we want to engage with. So I think we're going to have to learn to be dynamic and virtual and, uh, you know, build these relationships and do our jobs in a, in a virtual environment for a long time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I agree. I think the, um, the new term I've been using is the, the new abnormal, which I think is a better uh, term than this new normal, um, because it's, it's completely different and will continue to be this way for a long time. So I'm right there uh, with you. Um, how do how did you coach your your reps or your managers or your leaders to deal with this sort of kind of guilt or this fear of, um, you know, should I be selling right yeah. now? Well, at first, we took a pretty strong stance that we didn't want to be selling. So I think with like a lot of companies, we said, this is not the time to be engaging in commercial conversations. At the very beginning, it was, let's just, first of all, make sure that we are all healthy, safe, and you know, comfortable. And then let's make sure that our customers and prospects are. And so that's the only reason, like, let's reach out and see how we can help. And that was the primary guidance that we gave to everyone. Then we started to actually bucket our customers into the different categories of those that are in distress, those that are sort of frozen in that, that frozen mode could mean we, you know, budgets are frozen or there's so much uncertainty that they're not able to make decisions. But there are, there's a whole other bunch of customers that are actually going to benefit from this environment and they might be in growth mode and leaning into the opportunities that this crisis presents for their companies. And so first was trying to segment those and then, you know, for each of those different categories and groups, being able to give guidance to our team around if your customer's in distress mode, it's a very different conversation, obviously, than if they're in growth mode. Uh, yeah. And so part of it was being really prescriptive and getting us organized. Um, the other, and I'll tell it an interesting story that I think really is starting to give us just a tremendous amount of confidence. There are starting to be companies that were just really traditional industries, you know, outside of the tech sector that have been fully field, you know, in-person selling, whether that's door to door, but there was one that, that recently came on board and they, uh, they were, you know, knocking on warehouses and, you know, meeting with site managers. And that's part of it. That was how they were doing their sales motion. And when COVID hit, they, of course, could no longer do that. And so one of their uh, sales leaders engaged with us and we did a, a pilot together and talked about, you know, could this sales navigator be a good solution for them in this environment? And that pilot turned into um, a really big deal for them, as well as opening up a bunch of new opportunities with companies that they'd never imagine that they'd engage with because they were really hyper focused on their local market in those in person conversations and all of a sudden be moving their their selling motion to a digital platform and allowing them to you know scour the universe for prospects and buyers they were like gosh there are all these companies that we never thought we could get in front of that we're now able to engage and so what was interesting is in this case so they became a customer which is you know great outcome but the best part of the story is that they had actually furloughed a number of their employees prior to becoming to piloting the solution with us. They've now been able to win back so much revenue that they're bringing those employees back. So they, this is a company that was not digital at all and has made an entire shift. Their industry is shifting to this virtual selling environment. And I think that those stories, if we can find those, that's the story that I have for my team. But if each of us can find those success stories of real business impact, for our customers, then I think it gives us tremendous confidence 
to, it's not about going and closing the deal. It's about really adding value. And the, this is a, a situation where we're impacting people's livelihoods. And that I think makes everyone feel okay about or better about being able to reach out right now and say, how can we help? So I think that's, you know, something to, 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 you know, just to think about. Yeah. I think you can take a tremendous amount of, of hope in that arena and, and optimism. You know, I like to think I, before I, I put my viewpoint on it, you know, I'll ask the question, you know, if you, let's say, had a magic wand and you could take us into another dimension where um, the pandemic doesn't happen, do you think that we'd still be seeing these these changes take place? Would those companies eventually yeah. get there um, or or what are your thoughts there? I don't I don't think so. I mean, I think that I mean, may, some of them will. But many, yeah. I mean, many of us are not going to change until we're first forced to change. So, yeah. you know, I think that, um, you know, the, this has shifted. We've all had to go from whatever our natural state was three months ago to two months ago to an entirely new motion. And, um, you know, they're without a catalyst. And by the way, this isn't a great situation for everyone, right? So yeah. this is, it's, it's absolutely not a great, so that, I'm just giving one example of a company that, their business will be wildly different and hopefully they'll grow and be successful. But that's not the case for many companies who are going to be incredibly impacted negatively through this, no matter how they change their sales motion. It may be a product or a solution that just isn't going to thrive in this environment. So I think that, um, you know, hopefully where those companies that can be, um, be able to make the change and adapt, then, then great. Uh, but I don't know that all companies would, would, you know, go through, you know, moving to a, work from home environment or digital selling or, you know, changing their, their selling motion if, if, mm -hmm. if not prompted or required. Do you? Yeah. I mean, I'm curious what you're seeing, but I, I think it's hard to imagine. I, I like to think it was an accelerator. I think the, the kind of using the example that you used where they've transitioned their field sales into, you know, inside utilizing some of the more uh, best practices, call them that, you know, a, a traditional maybe tech company would use. I think it was coming. I, I think you're totally right. People don't change overnight. Um, I think the uh, I saw this cartoon that I think is I'll try and describe. There was a perfect illustration of this, and it was uh, these people sitting around uh, a boardroom, and someone is saying, uh, you know, the digital transformation thing. Yeah, it's great, uh, but it's still five years out. And then there was a wrecking ball that was called COVID nineteen. And it was coming to, you know, basically accelerate that that whole process. So yeah. I think that's how I I look at I look at it. And I, so in that scenario, I think there is some positives that, that come from it. Yeah, I think there's no question that it, it can be positive. But yeah, I think, you know, we would talk to people about digital transformation. And a lot of people didn't really know what that meant. And I think now we all we all get it. We all are having to live what digital transformation looks like on every facet. It's it's mm -hmm. the tools that we're using, it's a technology, um, it's the way that we're, we're changing the way we do business. And so, yes, it's it's a bit of, in some, again, in some ways, a, a, it's for some good change, uh, but mm -hmm. it's it's gonna be interesting, you know, to see how this plays out. Yeah, definitely. So I wanna quickly go to uh, some of these questions because we have a ton uh, rolling in. So there's a Q and A, section uh everyone so if you want them that's where i'll be fielding the questions so this is i'm going to pick this one because i know who this is katie ivy hello who i believe uh, the vp of sales at uh demand base i think i'm getting that right um katie has a, a question it would be interesting to hear uh from Alyssa's perspective about some of the trends she's seeing on linkedin uh from an insider's view um you know for me i've seen an tremendous uptick i think on linkedin of people just being there. Um, but uh, Katie says, it's definitely performing well for us. And I'd love to hear what uh, she's seeing in terms of engagement and creative things that are working in terms of using LinkedIn as a seller sales leader during this season. Yeah, so what you have experienced is what we're seeing in the data as well. So we we were doing some analysis to understand, you know, how has engagement changed? Uh, given this environment, and we are seeing higher levels of engagement on LinkedIn, and and again, that's that's just people like any one of us on this call going on and spending more time on LinkedIn. Now, 
there's probably a million reasons that we're doing that. Some people are looking for jobs. Some people are just trying to stay up to date with what's going on, posting, et cetera. But that spike in engagement, of course, is really good for the ecosystem and for anyone that's, that's using it. So um, we are seeing spikes across pretty much all industries. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, I'm glad, Katie, that it's, it's working well for you. Um, you. You'd asked, you know, what are some of the, I guess, creative or the, the things that are, we're seeing working. Um, you know, in some ways, the things that were working before are the things that are working now, but I actually think the bar is higher for engagement. So um, I was on a call with an analyst from Topo a few weeks ago, and he was sharing that um, in the early days of the, this pandemic, of course, it was harder to get calls with folks and pipelines were going down. I think, again, we're, we're kind of moving into that um, companies are unfreezing and figuring out, you know, if they're going to survive, they've got to start to figure out how they're going to lean on the front foot here. And so, mm -hmm. you know, people are taking meetings again, people are engaging, buying decisions are happening again. Um, but what I think has changed is that all of our tolerance for the kinds of conversations we're willing to have has gone up. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm, I'm sure that we all were, were protective of our calendars before. But today, in a virtual environment, when you're managing your kids and your dogs and your work and everything else, your your uh, you know energy for conversations that aren't super valuable is very low. And so, yeah. I think that it's requiring sellers to be even more customized and tailored in the outreach to have even more value to offer. And I think that value bar is is just higher than it's ever been. And I think it's going to also you know, any of the generic outreach that we might have gotten away with before, I think just isn't going to cut it right now. And so that's one of the things that I would encourage people to be thinking about and where we're seeing response rates just, you know, so much higher, of course, when it's customized, tailored, and it's really um, a more compelling narrative than, you know, I, I get, you know, notes in my email and otherwise that, you know, we all get them where you ignore them, but it's, it's a yeah. very few that, that are going to get through and get our attention right now, especially. Yeah. And, I agree. And, yeah, I was going to say, for, what about for you guys? What, what are you guys are working also with a, a similar demographic? So what's, yeah. what are some of the things that are resonating? I'll, I'll tell you in, uh, in the lens of the, the question. So, so opportunities I'm seeing on, on social community, LinkedIn is the access to leaders is easier than ever. You're right. The bar is higher than ever, but access is easier than ever. You know, I, I'm making a hypothesis, but I think more leaders, I've seen more leaders on there. And I think it's because they're trying to keep a pulse on what's going on. So they have it open all the time. And one thing, I'll give a super tactical example that um, we've been doing internally that has worked really well. I think right now there's this, uh, people do want to help. People want to get the economy moving. People know that buying things <laughs> brings money to the economy. And that is a really good thing right now. So people want to help. Um, what I started doing and some of our other leadership is it's a very tough time to be a, a BDR or SDR right now. So what you can actually do is leverage, and this is a play that's run a lot, but it's working right now particularly well, is look at all the connections that your leadership has and basically send a note that says something like this on LinkedIn. Hey, you know, it's an extremely difficult time um, out there right now for our BDRs, SDRs, people setting meetings. Um, I thought I would try and lend them a hand, you know, by making an introduction. You know, if this is a bad time, of course, health and safety over everything else. But I thought, you know, I would give a hand. And we've, we're seeing a really good response rate from a play uh, like that because people do want to help. help. Yeah. Essentially, yeah. yeah. Offering help to your internal team um and then offering that kind of ex externally if that is that am i explaining that I think yeah so. I think so. yeah so essentially reaching out to the a prospect account saying hey are it's it's difficult out there for SDRs, bdrs i'm sure you remember being an sdr bdr I, I thought i would make this facilitate this introduction in in hopes of of giving them a hand and then we're finding it people are are reciprocating on on the other end um okay so Let's shift gears uh, a little bit. So we talked about the bars raised for for meetings. Let's go a little bit um, more down the funnel. You know, I'm I'm we're certainly seeing if, if deals are getting done, 
uh, maybe there's more concessions involved. And it seems like the customer's needs are, are certainly changing uh, in this environment. Uh, are, what are you seeing um, in deals at, at LinkedIn? Are they still taking place? And what, what sort of needs to be addressed if they are moving forward? Yeah, well, so the, again, it, it, today, yes, a few weeks ago, it's, it felt weird like we were all frozen. Um, and the other thing is it really depends on the type, the part of the business. Our SMB customers are, a lot of them are still in distress and, you know, are still struggling. And so for those customers, it's how, how do we help right now? It's not about new sales. Um, and then for some of those, you know, the example I shared earlier, customers that are having to make a transition because their old sales promotion, the in-person selling no longer works. You know, those are the, some of the customers that are new that we wouldn't have necessarily thought of as a core part of our, um, you know, our, our opportunity. And I think that's one of the things that's changing for a lot of our customers too. And probably for everyone on this call is whatever your strategy was three months ago is out the window. And mm-hmm. whoever your buyers were might may might be the same, but they also might be very different. And I think that it's how it's recognizing that you know your old discovery may have worked then, but does it still work now? And really, even what you learned a few months ago, we are having to go back and and val- uh, validate or verify that it's still those are still the right challenges to help solve, or or they're not. And so I think that's um, you know one of the things that we're seeing changing. I think the other thing that we've seen is we're getting a lot more of the C-suite involvement at the uh, you know one yard line. So deals mm-hmm. that we might have done more easily when um, one of the the leaders we're working with could sign off today is getting a tremendous amount more scrutiny. And I uh, you know in conversations with actually some other folks at Outreach and, and others that I've been talking to, uh, I think we're we're all seeing this. So the bar again is is higher to spend money. No surprise there. Um, and the ROI, you know, the promise of, you know, a great value is not cutting it. So it's hard dollar mm-hmm. ROI and no longer the the soft and tangibles. And, and, you know, we see that with new business acquisition and with the renewals and customers really want to know that the, the money that they're spending is is really providing a return. And I think that's, that's another one where we're just as sellers are going to have to up our game and make sure that we've got a really solid business case. I mean, of course, that's good DNA in any Anytime, uh, but in a time like this, where budgets are you know hard to come by, um, and there's so many eyes on any deal, uh, that's what we're seeing. And again, I you know I'd love to hear if you guys are seeing anything differently. I think those are great, great callouts, and actually backed up um, not just anecdotally. I did a uh, webinar with our friends over at at Chorus, who actually just have some some data about this that they are seeing um, since COVID hit. Uh, a lot more C-suite involvement in almost any deal that that happens. So, no, I guess knowing that, yeah. how would you coach people to maybe get in front of that a yeah. little bit? So, we used to have a business case that really spoke to a, a, a sales leader, and now our litmus test is: is this would this meet um, the bar of a CFO? So, you know, that let's assume that every one of our proposals. It is going to have to go in front of a CFO and the, the, the value story is going to need to be in their language. And so that's part of the, the coaching that we're, we're giving is our, our buyers, our buyer circle and the influencers on this deal and the decision makers are, are different and changing. And so we need to think about how does our story change? How does the, the way that we communicate value change? Uh, and an upper game there. So that's one thing. Let me share a cu- another uh, couple of just really practical things that, yeah, uh, again, I, I learned from uh, well, from one of your call in a conversation that one of your colleagues and I were having, um, just about how we're coaching our reps and teams differently. And, um, you know, I think it, it's under the headline of controlling the controllables. In a virtual environment where, again, we're juggling a lot, it's hard to keep momentum going. And so, um, one of the suggestions was, you know, in a, in a world before we might have sent a follow up email to a bunch of people, you know, everyone that was on the call. Well, today it's more powerful to send a follow up email to each specific individual targeted and that follow up because it'll resonate more. And you might be able to engage in a dialogue versus a one to many approach that you usually aren't going to get a response. Um, another thing that we talked about was um doing the the meeting in between the meetings. So you might've done a disco that went well and you've got a demo set up, but before you even get to that demo, having a call with a couple of the key players to find out a little bit more intel, make sure you're teeing it up the right way 
and, and building some excitement for the next conversation. So you're just adding a number of extra steps to ensure that deals aren't falling apart through the process. Because in this environment, I think, you know, until the deal, until the deal is done, it's absolutely falling apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those are, are great things. So go with the kind of omni-channel approach. And for the follow-up, don't just send the blanket follow-up. Hey, it was great to meet everyone. Here's the deliverables. It's each specific stakeholder uh, right. cares about a different thing. I think that's awesome. Adding that extra step in for sure. And then I have to reiterate that the two other things you said there was you have to look at your value prop. If you're a sales leader on this, look at the value prop and say, does this matter to the C-suite, the CFO? Because that is who is going to be signing off on every single thing. And then the last thing you just quickly said at the beginning was uh, this idea that um, the plan is out the window. So traditional discovery was kind of trying to understand what their plan was and then slotting your product or service into where you could help them with that plan. That's traditional kind of what selling is at the end of the day and how you can provide value. And now some don't have a plan or they just scrapped their entire plan. So you have to be ready to have a, a pretty strategic conversation helping them build that plan. That's right. Um, and that's a big mindset shift that sellers have it, to make. It's a skills differentiator too. It's not just, yeah. it, part of it is mindset. You go from, I have something of value that you might want to, I am going to sit down on the same side of the table with you and I'm going to help you craft the plan that you now need. And whether my solution is part of it or not is sort of besides the point. And I mean, you know, that, that is, I, I actually think that what you just said about so many companies are trying to figure out, you know, which way is up right now. And mm -hmm. if you've got a perspective on the industry that you're in or the solution that you can provide that can help them through it, I think that's the conversation we want to be having. It has nothing to do with functionality and features at mm -hmm. all. In fact, like no one is interested in that right now. It's, it's how, do we, how do we work through this? Um, yeah. and, and I think it's, it also requires, it requires confidence as a seller. And it requires a little bit of the challenger mindset. You know, you need to be able to get comfortable with, you know, debating and having a little bit of that healthy tension. So, you know, I think it's all, it, it starts with mindset and it also includes some skill building. And, you know, it, we're also on our own journey of, you know, trying to get our team to develop that comfort as well. And, you know, I think every, every company right now has to really reevaluate. Did our selling motion before, will that still serve us or do we need to move to that more of that advisor stage? Yeah. Yeah. I think that there, again, these are, everything's just accentuated in this environment, but the top 1% sellers are doing that all the time. How the biggest deals get done is you're painting a future that they didn't even know could exist. Right. Um, and it is certainly a, a skill that's, that's developed. And that's when you truly you know, call it consultative approach where you, you view yourself as a consultant first and you're a seller. Right. The, the service is a, a byproduct of. Right. Of and, and, you know, there might be a big role for marketing to play right now. Um, you know, you just made me think about, we often have case studies that marketing will pull together and they're usually uh, great examples of, you know, a success it, or or we celebrate wins internally, a, a great deal that was closed. But I think right now what our sellers really need is the confidence, the conviction, and the examples of those those use cases where mm -hmm. one of our team members has really been able to partner with a customer and help them change the trajectory of their business, right? So that's probably the work that we need our marketing teams to be helping us with to some extent right now is mm -hmm. highlighting and profiling those wins and those examples for others within the team so that they can start to do the same and develop that same skill set. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so I wanna go, we have, again, tons and tons of questions. Um, we, okay, we're about halfway through. Okay, this is a great question. This is from Anonymous, don't know their name, uh, but thank you for the question. This is a huge, huge question. And this, um, I get all the time, whether COVID era or not, a lot of sales reps are, uh, are stuck in their classic old school ways. As a 27 year old marketing specialist, I am trying to help my sales team expand their horizon and grow in the digital world of sales. What would you recommend doing or training them on to help them start utilizing social media 
and digital platforms uh, more effectively coming from an older generation. Yeah. The, a common problem we see typically outside of, of tech. Sure, sure. Well, you know, those old school sellers and more traditional sellers are, I mean, they're going to have to, they're going to sink or swim right now. I mean, you obviously can't be doing the old school methods. Uh, and so learning to use new tools and new platforms is is critical. And one of the things that we have seen in the research that we've done is that, you know, no surprise, trust is one of the biggest uh, differentiators between, you know, whether someone's willing to make an investment with you or not. And one of the ways that you can build trust is by becoming a thought leader. And you can do that on LinkedIn. You can do that on a bunch of different platforms online. Uh, and that's one of the ways that I think some of the older school sellers who probably have a tremendous amount of knowledge, they probably have great connections and networks. Uh, they can be either publishing content or they can be commenting and sharing content. And that's one thing that I would recommend that they, they think about. And, you know, it will take some handholding. Um, you know, some of those folks may not have profiles and you might really need to help them understand what's in it for them. Um, so helping them understand that, you know, trust in the building trust in a digital world is probably going to be done online, not necessarily going out and playing golf together or going and having you know a nice dinner. Uh, it, you know, there's different ways that we're gonna have to approach that. So that's one thing that I would recommend. Um, the other is, you know, those sellers are probably really great at networks, but they probably haven't tapped into the networks of the people that they work with. And that's one of the great, you know, assets of mm -hmm. these online. Uh, platforms as we can see the connections and how we're connected to buyers and prospects that we want to get engaged with. So helping them understand um, what kinds of doors can their senior executives open for them. Um, we you know have some silly and wonderful stories at the same time. And I'm sure every company has this where, you know, you have a a seller who's trying to break into some big account and they, they've been knocking their head, you know, against the, the door for, for years and can't get in. And turns out that the, the key prospect they're trying to get in, in, you know, in with is married to the person that's six months next to them. And they never made that connection because they didn't have the, you know, the visibility, and maybe not next to yeah. them, but the person down the hall. And we all have those stories at our company of, you know, whether it's the executive team, the, uh, the board members, uh, the investors, they have incredible networks that we can tap into. And so helping those older school sellers, more traditional sellers to understand that that's a whole treasure trove that can open doors. Um, mm -hmm. So those might be two that I, I would offer. Yeah, I think those are great. You know, sharing those, those real stories are, are so impactful. And for whoever answer, uh, asked that question, I think a, a good way to look at it too is try and be the bridge between legacy and innovation because legacy is there for a reason. So these sellers have a lot of extremely valuable information um, and tactics and strategies that maybe you have no idea about. So start thinking of yourself as it is a two way, you know, bridges go both ways. So, you know, if you're gonna do maybe a lunch and learn on how to uh, use Sales Navigator or how to build a personal brand, Make sure you give them a platform too. Uh, let's hear from you as well. And yeah. then you can kind of intermingle the two strategies. And I think that's when a lot of magic happens. You know, Scott, one other thing that I would throw out is a lot, oftentimes in those traditional um, selling environments, or, or people will say, well, I know everyone that I need to know in that account. And I don't, I think right now, no one can say that. You know, there's been so much transition. There have been layoffs, there have been furloughs people are changing roles that happens in any you know in any given year about 20% of you know decision makers will will change roles well in this environment that I, I don't know what the exact number right now is but we know it's it's exponentially higher than 20% and so if we were relying on the older relationships or existing relationships we're really putting ourselves at risk and so i think one of the things that we also want to teach them is building that network of influencers within any account. And we did some research and saw that when when um, most sellers were connected to actually like 1.2 buyers within any of their customer base. And, and that, sorry, this was connected on LinkedIn as we could measure it. Uh, mm -hmm. But the, those that were connected to six or more had much, much, much higher uh, conversion rates because they of course had a broader network within those accounts, more access to the influencers. And so that's another thing that I think marketing can help 
again, a more traditional you know, sales team to understand how there are just many more people involved in a buying decision than there were, you know, even again, like we said, even three months ago. Yeah, yeah. I'll even kind of take that, th go down a little bit further. I think we will see a future uh, in five years where let's say I'm an account executive and I'm going for a role. I actually wrote about this last week. I'm going for a role and I'm interviewing on Alyssa's team. And you know I've got six interviews. Alyssa gives me thumbs up. One of them is the VP of marketing. She gives thumbs down, vetoes me. I don't get the job. I find out later that you know someone with 500 more connections got the job. And I think, well, that's silly. But if you did that same thing for 30 hires in a year, imagine how many more people your company has access to, right? So I think as sellers, we have to be ready for that, that uh, people will start looking at your digital networks because they have, they have value, they have inherent value in there. Um, so I don't think we're far, far away from something like that um, actually happening. Um, so Alyssa, I want to talk a little bit about, so the new abnormal, we don't know exactly what it looks like, um, but this is not going to be, presumably, it feels like, not the last time we're faced with a crisis. Who knows what that looks like? You know, we had 08, we had the financial crisis, we have this. Uh, if you've read about this, it sounds like there's could be second waves, there could be third waves, there could be new, whatever it looks like. How important is it to stay nimble um, with your teams, be able to pivot quickly, and other than just kind of buzzwords of being nimble and, and pivoting, how can you strategically do that? Or how, do, how are you thinking about it right now? If I'm being really honest, I don't know that I'm ready to think about the next pandemic <laughs> or crisis yet. Uh, we're still working through this one. Uh, but, you know, yes, I, of course, being flexible. One thing that we talk a lot about within our, our company and our team is change and, and change management. And a huge part of you know, going through any crisis is getting everyone to, to, to shift direction and ideally do it quickly and effectively. And you know what, you're not going to be able to bring everyone along, you know, hopefully, you can um, set a new vision, you can help people understand the why and the how and the what. Um, and hopefully, most of them will, will get on board and some of them will really struggle. And, you know, I think you just do your best to um, identify what's the new normal, what do we need to change from our strategy that we have? You know, we're we're going through, we're about to end our, our fiscal year on June 30th. And so we were in the midst of planning for next year. So talk about having to, to be nimble, everything that we had planned for, we've now got to go back to the drawing board and, and think differently. So again, it's going back and reevaluating where where's our market opportunity, where's our risk? Um how is our value proposition different? I think all of those things are probably things that in any kind of crisis that we encounter in the future, those are going to be some of the core things that we're going to have to evaluate as well, of course, is, you know, how's our team doing and what do they need differently from us? I mean, the the types of things I'm spending time on today are wildly different than they were six months ago. The amount of time I'm spending with my team um, and the individual contributors and the kinds of conversations we're having totally different. And I think that's mm -hmm. another key of managing through a crisis is making sure that you've got the right communication channels and, you know, and, and the right direction forward. But it's, it's a journey. And I sure hope we do not have another one anytime soon. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. And all right. So we're going to get to some of these questions, kind of wrapping up some of the things that I wanted to cover. So one thing that that you mentioned that I kind of breezed over a little bit, but you mentioned that, you know, the targets now have become so important. The, the companies that you're reaching out to and you kind of have this, you're utilizing more data and analytics, right? Than, than maybe you would in, we'll call it peacetime. Do you see that trend uh, continuing? Because I do understand, I think next webinar we do, We'll have like a uh, an analyst to dive deeper into some of the the research and and data and analytics. But do you think that as a whole, sales is just going to continue to get more data driven? Oh, I think no doubt, no doubt. I mean, this this is one of those topics that I think you know we talked about digital transformation earlier. I think becoming more data driven is going to be it's going to be table stakes. Actually, not just for 
the, the sales leadership team, but I actually think for reps as well. Um, and, and I think, you know, in this environment, what it's forcing us to do is, you know, scour the universe. Um, the, uh, one of the questions I saw in the thread was how did we segment, you know, the, with those three buckets earlier, maybe just as a simple example of how, you know, data is driving some of our decision-making, um, you know, before we might've, you know, we go through the whole territory assignment process and our looking at our TAM and the market opportunity and all of that. Well, now we've had to, again, throw some of that, not all of it, but some of it out the window and reevaluate what is our total addressable market look like? Um, what's coming in that we didn't know about before and what's moving out? Yeah. What, which part of our business is being impacted differently? And then trying to understand by industry, you know, we have the the, I guess, benefit of being able to see on LinkedIn where, you know, some industries might be spiking right now in terms of their engagement, others might go lower. So that can help to inform. And I, I, you know, hopefully many companies have a version of that for whatever industry you're in that you can start to understand, um, you know, who are the, the customers or prospects that um, are going to be more or less engaged with us right now. And, and some of that will be data driven and some will be anecdotal. And by the way, the anecdotal is just as important right now. Uh, because a lot of the the feedback that our our sellers are sharing is going to inform some of the strategy too. So I think it's that combination, but I think it's going to be the companies that use data intelligently are going to absolutely. Um, I think it's I think it's table stakes, and I think everyone's going to have to, you know, just get even more precise about where they're they're spending their resources because the resources and, and the time are super limited right now. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Paying attention, so paying attention to those anecdotes, you know, intent data becoming more and more important. Solutions like LinkedIn can help with that. Paying attention to overall macro trends too, and where industries are heading, so you can kind of predict. Okay, there's going to be growth in this industry. That overlays with our TAM. Let's double down there. Um, another really tactical one is just paying hyper attention to where you're getting inbound leads from yes. as well, and using that as a um, a trigger to say, hey, here's why did this happen? Um, let's go talk to them, see their need, and then maybe doing some outbound motions yeah. um, on them. Okay, last last question for me, and then we're I'm just gonna we're gonna rapid fire some questions because we have like 20. Um, but the question is, is there any opportunities that sellers might be missing right now? Any kind of quick wins, if you will. Quick wins. Well, I don't know if they're quick wins in, in this environment, <laughs> but, um, you know, maybe I'll share one thing for, for companies that may be in a tougher situation right now. I've, I've heard a lot of companies are investing really um, a lot of energy in, in skill building. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you, if you have a business or sellers where it's not appropriate to be reaching out to a particular um, part of your, you, you know, your audience, or it's not appropriate to be going to market in the same way that you used to. This is a great time to be building skills and, you know, thinking about how do we, you know, get prepared for a return to normal if, if, if and when that comes. So I think that's maybe an opportunity, but not a quick win. Um, you know, I, I think per the the, converse, the question about helping more traditional sellers, I think in the future, hopefully the, the field sellers or the traditional sellers that can take the best of what was working for them before and complement it with learning you know, to how to leverage social media and, and these digital platforms, hopefully they'll be even more successful in being able to bring both of those together. So hopefully that's something that, you know, may not be as an overnight win for people, but, um, but on the back end of this, those will, those folks will be even more effective because they'll have more, you know, more assets to, to tap into. Um, yeah, I think that's all I got. What, how about you? That's a, that's a great one. And the people that are joining us are doing that right now, hopefully doing a little bit of uh, strategic skill building. Uh, the one I will highlight is uh, focusing and growing your current customer base mm. um, and nurturing those relationships that you already have. You know, put my buyer hat on, people that, you know, reach out to me. I've had a few sellers uh, who have just reached out and provided some sort of value with nothing, no ask in return. So focus on those relationships that you have. Um, be very grateful for your current customer base yeah. um, and go above and beyond. And there is growth potential. We've, we've seen yeah. some growth potential and maybe it takes a little, um, you know, concessions on your part or you come to the table with a creative solution. Um, and specifically 
enterprise companies, some of them are looking at this as sort of an an opportunity, if you will, right? They see that uh, they might be able to get long-term benefit because they have capital now. So right. um, do think about that when, yeah. at least when you're talking to the enterprise. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a great point. And, and actually that that's, it's something that we've been spending a lot of time thinking about. And, and I would actually posit that a lot of companies have been focused so much on acquisition. And you're right mm-hmm. that in this environment, investing so much more deeply in the customers that you already have. And, you know, we talked about, you know, everyone's in customer success right now. So it doesn't matter, you know, what your, your, your quota is or what your day job is. Everyone is, needs to be focused on customer value. And, and I think you're right. There may not be near term returns and there may not be returns at all in some cases. And that's not the point. And so if we can invest deeply, add value, we're not only going to help, but, you know, hopefully there's, there's some benefit on the other side for some of those opportunities. That's really, really poignant advice. Yeah. It's a, it's about playing the, the long game. And yeah. if you play the longest game, sometimes you actually never expect anything. And that's, that's yeah. okay. You don't yeah. need to, to give to get, you can just give. Um, and that's the best long game you can do. All right. Well, Alyssa, if you're with me, let's just rapid fire through some of these questions. We got nine minutes left. Thank you all for hanging out with us right till the, the very end and keep the, the questions coming. We'll try and get through as many as we can. First question, this goes back to when you were talking about the three buckets that you bucketed kind of your ICP into. Um, Anonymous Atenu wants to know, um, how were you able to segment into these three buckets and did you use SalesNav for that? Like, where did you where did you collect that information to make those decisions? Sure. So some of it was looking at um, the intent data or the activity on LinkedIn. So that's, again, a unique asset that we have. But we also use, can we look at CRM data? And part of it was just looking at, at industry segmentation and making some of our best guesses. So if you're a company that has less of the data, I think you can sit down and probably in not too much time understand that you know, certain sectors, depending on what you, your business is, there are certain sectors that are going to be primed for what you have to offer. And there are going to be others that may be completely off the table right now and just helping to segment by industry. That would be the first cut I would do. And then again, for us, we were able to look at some additional layers of data that probably, um, you know, that, that you may, may or may not have access to, but that's where I'd start. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. So pulling from, from multiple sources as well as anecdotes and just keeping your head up as a leader. Yeah. And the field feedback is super, super mm. useful. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, I love that. Okay, here's Anita Peterson. Anita, thank you for the question. Uh, this is a tough one that I'll I'll, uh, I'll wrestle with, with you on this one. So I struggle with working with food manufacturers where mm-hmm. production managers and operation types typically don't use much social sites or uh, keep them updated. Alternatives out there. So read between the lines. What I'm hearing is I sell to a, a buyer or a prospect that is not on LinkedIn currently, or they don't use social media, uh, what are ways we can keep them informed, still engage outside of some of the maybe traditional me? I, I wish I had a great answer. Let me think about this. You, you said you'd help me out on this one. Yeah, um, yeah. So if they're, if they're not on LinkedIn and they're not on other social platforms, um, well, I guess I, I would hope that in this environment, you or in this case, you've got you know, the, you've been in touch with at least some of them before. So you could either follow up an existing communication. So whether that was, um, you know, emails that you'd sent before, people are absolutely forwarding their office phones to their home phones in some cases, although certainly not everywhere. Um, and I did see, I don't know who that was, Jim, thanks for that. Um, yeah, texting is is another great option if you've got that kind of relationship. I think, you know, I think we have to be careful about mm-hmm. you know how we engage and and the medium because you know pe- different people have different thresholds for what they're comfortable with but if you've already been in touch with someone via text or phone call or email you know that i think those are all totally appropriate channels to continue to engage on that's yeah. got any other thoughts i have a, i have a couple one brandon thanks for the the all caps uh, comment try texting them i i would be wary of you know, texting's okay when you have certain uh, relationships in place. If you are, I think in this case, it sounds like they're not an overly tech savvy buyer. That's why they're not on LinkedIn. So they might be freaked out if you just all of a sudden text them. Um, so if you're going to do that approach, uh, do ask for permission 
uh, first. Of course, there's good old fashioned phone calls. Here's my view on community. LinkedIn is the biggest and, uh, and an amazing community. You can create communities in all sorts of formats, whether that is inviting your prospects to an educational webinar roundtable via Zoom, um, inviting them to a food manufacturing highlights of the week newsletter. Um, there's things like Substack where you can easily create a newsletter. You as a sales rep, even an individual contributor can create a little website on WordPress that keeps up with food manufacturing news. Um, so I look at that. If there is no community, it's such a fantastic opportunity for you to build that community. Yeah. And I was going to say two, two others that I would recommend in that spirit of community is, um, you know, one is when we started first going through this, uh, I just got a bunch of sales leaders together to, you know, just get together and, and talk about as practitioners, how are we all managing? So just a meeting of the minds and that's something that, you know, can be useful. And then the other is, um, I've heard some creative stories about folks who are, you know, maybe um, sending a lunch to, uh, you know, like create a little virtual lunch meeting and or coffee, coffee meeting. So you schedule a call and, you know, that's just a nice way to sort of build community and build connection in a world where, you know, we're, we can take it more to the, the in-home real life virtual version, as opposed to needing it to be on some sort of, you know, social media platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like it. Okay, here's one. This is Andy Leventhal going straight for the the jugular, if you will. So he would like some specifics, very hyper specific, of what your team is doing differently than before in in three areas. Okay. Uh, tools. So, is there any tools that maybe you purchased or stopped using since this? Uh, techniques, and then forecasting. Forecasting is a tough one. That could probably be a whole other webinar, because if anyone has figured out how to accurately forecast in this environment, please let me know. And I think you'll be a very rich man or woman. Um, so tools, techniques, forecasting, how have those shifted uh, over the last couple months? Yeah. So on the tools side, we haven't purchased anything new for this environment in terms of technology, but a couple that have become, I think, even more useful or valuable. Um, so whether it's a gong or a chorus, or I think you guys might have announced that you're doing something in the recording, but any, any way you can get analytics, yeah. <laughs> um, analytics around um, conversations at, at an aggregate level, and also to be able to coach our reps. So when you can't sit next to a rep and be on a call at the same time, um, that kind of technology has been really useful for us. Uh, again, both for the coaching, but but actually from a macro perspective for us to be able to, one of the things that we, we saw recently is, you know, a few weeks ago, a lot of the, anything, any conversation related to COVID was generally like a negative outcome on the call. We're now starting to see where COVID's being mentioned. There's actually, these companies are moving out of the frozen mode into more of the um, kind of front foot. And so it's leading to more positive intent or sentiment. So that kind of intelligence can be really helpful. Uh, so that's one. Um, and, and then, you know, I think, cadence tools, whatever flavor, um, mm -hmm. where you can, you know, we want to bring the human element always and the customized element always to the, the engagement. But if you can get some assistance in doing it in a, in a um, less, uh, let's say like people folk or what's the right word, way to say this, but where there's more machinery involved and less human intervention involved. Um, so mm -hmm. you can just, you know, get a little bit of time back so we can spend more time in the conversation rather than crafting the emails and sending them. I think those types of things can be really useful. So those are two things that in this environment um, we're, we're sort of doubling down on. Um, on the strategies, I mentioned the segmentation of our customers was a huge thing. Um, encouraging our team to focus way more on customer value than, than worrying about revenue and bookings right now um, has actually been a really important strategy shift and just guidance and that we're giving to our teams. Um, and then again, that guidance that we're giving around everything needs to meet the CFO threshold. So if you were designing a, a proposal for a sales leader to buy off um, or sign off on it now, let's make sure that it meets that next bar of, you know, somebody who's, you know, in the, in, in the finance world, who's really going to make sure that it, it's a good use of dollars. And, and so making sure that those are super tight business cases. So those are a few of the things um, I think I'm getting asked to participate in more conversations, so more executive engagement. Uh, those are maybe before that I'd share. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think those are, are great ones. So look at, you know, conversational intelligence, fantastic tools, sales engagement, whichever uh, flavor. Um, and yeah, I think the last thing you said there, getting your, getting out there more, getting your, just because you can't go and fly to conferences or people or things, just stay super busy, whether it's webinars like this or, or, uh, or other functions. Well, Alyssa, that was amazing. Thank you so much for all of your, your insight. Uh, quickly, as we wrap up, uh, Sales Hacker and LinkedIn will be doing more of these uh, together. Uh, we cannot improve without your feedback. So I hope you got as much value out of that as, as I did. But let's launch a really quick uh, poll. Um, how helpful was this webinar for you? Let us know. Um, you can always uh, reach out to me via LinkedIn. If people want to continue the conversation with you, Alyssa, or learn more about LinkedIn, what's the best way to do so? Yeah, well, you can find me on LinkedIn, Alyssa Merwin on LinkedIn. I uh, feel free to reach out. And I, you know, I just, thanks for the great conversation. And thank you. I, I love the interaction and all the questions and comments. So thanks for everybody for being part of the conversation with us. And I wish everyone the best as we all navigate this together. I love it. And we've got 38% saying very helpful. Thank you all. Uh, we do try try our best. Uh, Alyssa, thank you again. Excited to have you back and continue this conversation. And uh, for all of those who joined us, I agree. Great engagement. It was a lot of fun. And uh, we'll see you next time.